Katie tossed a coin 200 times and threw 109 heads. Joe tossed the same coin 400 times and threw 238 heads. Lucy tossed the same coin 500 times and threw 291 heads. Katie, Joe and Lucy now think the coin may be biased. So why is that the case? Well, um, we can see that when Katie threw the coin, she, more than half the time she threw heads. 109 is more than half of 200. Similarly, when Joe threw the coin, more than half the time, he threw heads. Half of 400 is 200, and he threw more than 200 heads, as you can see. And similarly for Lucy. So this has happened three times. So there's a good chance that the coin is biased towards heads. Okay, so let's consider um, the best estimate of the probability of throwing heads. So what we need to do is pool all the throws together, all the tosses together. So the kind was tossed 200 times, 400 times, and 500 times. If we could just add these three numbers together, that gives us the total number of tosses. That's 1,100. And then we just count up the number of times that heads appeared. It's 109, 238, and 291. So we put those values together, we see that out of 1,100 tosses in total, 638 of them are heads. So to estimate that probability, we put the number of heads over the total number of tosses, and that comes to 0.58. Joe agrees with Lucy's estimate of 0.58 as the probability of throwing a head with this kind. He claims that the probability of throwing three successive heads with this kind is less than the probability of throwing two successive tails. Okay, so we're going to see whether or not Joe's claim is true. So, the probability of three heads is 0.58 to the power of three. We're dealing with independent events. So the probability of getting three heads on this kind is the probability of getting heads times itself three times. For this bias kind, probability of getting heads is 0 0.58. So you see we multiply to get a number 0.195 that's smaller than 0.58. So that's a reasonable answer. If we add 0.58 to itself three times, of course, we'll get a meaningless answer. Okay, so the probability of getting three heads is obviously less than... The probability of getting three heads in a row is obviously less than the probability of just getting heads. Now the probability of getting two tails is got by considering the probability of getting tails. Well, that's just 1 minus the probability of getting heads. Okay, the kind can only show tails or heads. The sum of those two probabilities must be 1. So 1 minus 0.58 is 0.42. The probability of getting two tails in a row, again we're dealing with independent events, is 0.42 times 0.42, which is 0.176. Since 0.176 is less than 0.195, we conclude that Joe's claim is not true. An unbiased circular spinner has a movable pointer and five equal sectors, two colored green and three colored red. So we want the probability that the pointer stops on green for one spin of the spinner. So the circular spinner is unbiased, so the, the pointer is equally likely to point to any of the five sectors, okay? It's an unbiased spinner and the sectors are equal in area, or these angles are the same, I should say. The areas don't have to be the same, actually, it's the angles that have to be the same. It's five angles. So basically we want the proportion of the angles that are green. Well, that's two out of the total number, which is five. So two-fifths of the time, the pointer will point to a green sector. Next, we will list all the possible outcomes of three successive spins of the spinner. Okay, so let's consider an outcome for the first spin. Well, it could either be, it could either be red or green. Let's suppose it's red. Let's suppose that the second spin is also red. And we can pretend that the third spin is red. Before we list all the outcomes, let's consider the number of outcomes. So, 
for the first spin, we can have two outcomes. For the second spin, there are two possible outcomes. And for the third spin, there are two possible outcomes. So how many outcomes are there in total? Well, we just apply the fundamental principle of counting. We just multiply these together. So there are actually eight outcomes altogether. Eight different um, possible outcomes for three successive spins of the spinner. So that should help us answer the question. We need to list eight outcomes. So let's consider a reasonably systematic way of doing this. Let's keep the first two spins as red. We change the third one. Let's suppose the first two are red and the third one is green. So we've taken care of the situations where the first two spins are red. So there are two possible outcomes. When the first two spins are red, we could have red, 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 or red, red, green. Now let's imagine that the first spin is red, and uh, the next two spins can be anything we like. Let's consider the outcomes for that situation. Well, we could write red here, but we've already covered that situation, so let's go red, green. Let's look at the outcomes here. Okay, well, we could have red, green, red, or we could have red, green, green. Now, so we've covered a situation where the first few spins are red. Okay, these two outcomes is where the first spin is red. This outcome is where the first two spins are red. And this outcome is where the first three spins are red. So we could repeat this, repo uh, this process for green. Let's suppose that the first, all three spins are green. There's only one possibility there. Next, we can consider situa the situation where first two spins are green. Now we can't repeat this one, so we can only have green, green, red. Finally we look at the situation where just the first, where the first spin is green. Um, okay, I can't write down green, green, so I have to go green, red, because green, green, red, and green, green, green were covered, so if we have GR here, well we're, we have two possibilities for the third spin now. Um, it could be green or it could be red. By the way, we could have just interchanged R with G. You know, just replace all the R's with G's to go from here to here. And similarly for the other outcomes, just interchange R with G. So anyway, we have all eight outcomes. <coughs> A game consists of spinning the spinner three times. Each time the spinner stops on green, the player wins one euro. Otherwise, the player wins nothing. For example, if the outcome of one game is green, red, green, the player wins two euros. So now we want to complete this table. Um, so, the spinner is spun three times. For the player to win zero euros, those three spins must be red. Okay. Um, if the pointers points to red, the player wins nothing. So to win nothing in a full game, the pointer must point to red three times. Now to win a euro, the pointer must point to green one time. So we need to consider those outcomes of three spins of the spinner that have just one G in them. Okay. So there's three ways that we can arrange the letters R, R, and G. We can put G at the end, we can put it in the middle, or we can put it at the start. To win two euros, G must appear twice. So we just, and R must appear exactly once. So how many ways can we combine one R with two Gs? Well, R can appear at the start, it can appear in the middle, or it can appear at the end. But the key thing is to have just two G's in our combination. And finally, to win three euros, well, the spinner has to point to G three times. There's only one way that that can happen. One spin of the spinner is an example of a Bernoulli trial. This is something I discussed in a previous video. A Bernoulli trial is a trial in which 
there are just two outcomes. That's the key thing. There are just two outcomes. And sometimes the outcomes are referred to as success or failure. Since there are only two possible outcomes, the probability of a success plus the probability of a failure must equal 1. Since S or F are the only two possible outcomes, the sum of their probabilities must be a certainty, must be 1. 